Oops. Hi, this is Christina with the Stage Nature Center. We'll be starting here just uh, momentarily. Hello again, this is Christina here at the Stage Nature Center. Um, I am going to get started here in just a moment. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm using a new program to do the stream today. Um, so if somebody wants to let me know that they are hearing me okay, um, in just a moment I'm going to switch it over to the video. But I can see your comments right now, so if somebody would let me know that they are hearing me okay, that would be great. And uh, just a moment, I'm going to get started here with um, the video. Okay, excellent. All right. Uh, hi, this is Christina at the Stage Nature Center. Hope you guys are doing well today. And um, I am here today to talk about monarch butterflies, um, which is one of my favorite topics to talk about here at the Nature Center. Um, I, it's something that I do uh, that I t uh, do during the summertime is raise monarch butterflies here at the Nature Center, and then um, we will raise them and um, eventually release them at the end of the summer. So we'll be talking all about monarch butterflies today. Before I get started with that, um, just to review a couple things, like I said, I'm here at the Stage Nature Center and, um, and in Troy, Michigan, and uh, while the the building is closed. The trails are still open. I'm imagining that a lot of people are going to be out on the trails today. It's a beautiful day. Um, in fact, I hope to get out a little bit later on today to take some videos on the trails that I can share with you here on Facebook for those of you that can't get out here. Um, but uh, the trails are still open, dawn to dusk. So we uh, encourage you to come out, but make sure that you still practice safe social distancing. Uh, keep six feet apart. There should be a plenty of room on the trails for you to be able to do that. Again, the building is still closed, and as of right now, we are planning on being closed through the end of May with a reopening date of June 2nd. And of course, that is um, dependent upon uh, that's dependent upon how everything how everything goes. So hopefully we'll be reopening the very beginning of June. Our programs right now are canceled, um, which of course is um, disappointing. You know, we miss doing programs with you guys. That's why I'm doing these. Um, but as some of you may know, the Troy Nature Society, which is who I work for, uh, we are a private nonprofit organization that does the programming here at the Stage Nature Center and manages the Stage Nature Center. Um, in partnership with the city of Troy. The city of Troy um, maintains the property. And uh, that is the main source of our funding. So um, I, 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 oh goodness, I think I, um, I don't, uh, I, 
I thought I added the donate button, but um, I apologize for that. I'm looking at my screen here trying to see if I, I don't see it for some reason. Um, hmm. Let's see. Okay. Well, um, you can definitely donate here uh, on our Facebook page. I apologize. I don't see the donate button coming up on the screen here. I thought I put it up. But, um, you know, again, uh, without our programs, that's our main source of funding. So um, if you're able to donate and you have the means, which I know a lot of people right now are struggling as well. A lot of other organizations are. But if you are able to, we'd appreciate a donation. Um, with that said, this past Tuesday we had a naming fundraiser for our green frog. So if you joined us on Tuesday or you went back and saw the live video feed from Tuesday, we featured our green frog ambassador here at the Nature Center. And we did a um, we did a bidding fundraiser where people could bid for uh, to put in the highest amount and whoever it was the highest bidder got to name the green frog. So um, I am going to, I'd like to, to name the winner um, of the bidding contest and a big thank you. Her, her name is Sherry Rolf and I think I saw her joining us today, which is wonderful. We want to thank you. Uh, she bid a hundred dollars to name the green frog. So we appreciate other people who uh, bid to name the green frog as well, but this will help us uh, with the continued care of the animals. Um, and she also shared the name that she is going to name the green frog, and that, that name is going to be Zaba, Z-A-B-A, -A, which uh, actually means frog in Polish. So our new green frog, or not our new green frog, our green frog's name is going to be Zaba. So again, thank you, Sherry, for your uh, generous donation to help support the Sage Nature Center and to name our green frog. We really appreciate it. So um, again, we will do uh, probably do another naming fundraiser. Uh, for a couple of other animals that we have here, keep your eyes on Facebook, and we'll we'll announce the details of that. Um, but that's another way you can support us, and uh, and we we appreciate what everybody is doing to to support us. So um, I'm trying to I, I make sure I went over all the the business <laughs> side of things. So uh, like I said, today we're going to be talking about monarch butterflies, um, and I do have some videos and pictures to show you. Um, these videos, most of these videos are videos that I have taken over the years, um, over the pre past few years or so, uh, through the monarch raising season. The monarch butterflies have not returned here yet to Michigan, but they're, they're such an amazing species. All of them are amazing, all butterflies are, but monarchs, they do this unique round trip um, migration every year of about 3,000 miles. And they, they most of them go down to Mexico during the winter time. There are not, uh, they, this is a very unique migration for, for, for butterflies. There are other butterflies that migrate short distances, but monarchs are the only ones that do this round trip migration, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a bit, but that's one of the things that makes them so fascinating. Um, and it's really neat to participate in their life cycle and see how they change um, and help to support them. We'll also talk in a little bit about things that you can do to support monarch butterflies um, here soon when they start returning. Hopefully we'll start seeing them maybe in May here. Um, and then uh, I will be raising monarch butterflies again here at the Nature Center um, this summer. And you can come see the life stages of the monarch butterfly. It's a really neat thing to be able to see. Um, so I am going to switch it over here to... Um, to the videos and the presentation that I have to show you. You should still be able to hear me. Like I mentioned, I'm using a new software today to help me with this since last week <laughs> with the uh, wildlife videos that I showed you of the wildlife feeders um, had a little bit of trouble, but uh, this is a new software that I'm using. So hang in there with me. If we get disconnected, I will reconnect. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, we're all, <laughs> I'm learning about this as we go. So I'm going to switch the screen here to our the presentation and 
Let's see here. Okay. So hopefully you can still hear me. Um, I, I have switched to, it's still the same picture of the, the butterfly that you saw earlier. Uh, I'm going to give this just a moment because there is a little bit of a lag time, but before I keep going, I want to make sure that you all can, can hear me and see me. Uh, while I'm waiting for it to do that, I, uh, let's see. Um, you, please feel free to, to put some questions in the comments. I will do the best I can to, um, to answer those questions as we go through the presentation here. If I don't answer your questions during the presentation, then I will um, get to those questions after the presentation. Let's see here. Um, Give me just a moment. I'm trying to get this. Okay, uh, one moment. Oh boy. I'm sorry, like I said, I, this is a new software and I thought this was Okay. For some reason, it's not showing the exact same screen that I'm seeing. Um, I know I have a couple questions coming in. I'll answer those in just a moment here after I figure out why this is not showing. Okay, well, I may have to show you the pictures from here like this. I think that'll that will work. Okay. So um, let's get started by looking a little bit at their life cycle. So here is here's a picture. Um, like I said, a lot of these pictures that I have have taken or that you're seeing today and the videos, are pictures and video that I have taken here at the Nature Center um, of, of the monarchs as I raise them. So this first picture that you're seeing here is actually of an egg. Um, their eggs are very, very tiny. Um, they're really hard to see. And when you're looking for eggs on milkweed, they can be very hard to find. It really takes some practice to learn how to um, to identify them and to see them. But these are their eggs, and if you look on this picture, it's kind of hard to see, but they do have little ridges on their eggs. And this picture was actually taken underneath one of our microscopes here. Last, this past uh, year, we had a grant um, that allowed us to get some microscopes that have the, have the ability to look at things digitally on a screen and take pictures and video, which is amazing. And we're gonna be using them for programs coming up. Um, this is a picture of a, a picture of a close up of one of the eggs. Now, as monarchs are getting ready to to hatch, their eggs change color, and it's really quite amazing. You can see the top of the egg here; it starts to get dark with kind of this goldish color, and that's how you can tell that a monarch is getting ready to emerge from the egg is when that dark, that the top of it starts to get a little bit dark. Now, 
Now the, the eggs, they actually hatch in three to four days after, uh, after, the, after the monarch lays the eggs, the female lays the eggs. They'll hatch in three to four days. And once they hatch, the baby caterpillar actually eats its way out of out of the um, out of the egg so it'll eat its way out of the egg and it'll actually sometimes even eat the egg but here you can see it's kind of hard to see I'll show you a close-up in just a minute of a baby caterpillar but just to show you how small they are this is a baby caterpillar on a milkweed now I, I didn't mention this yet earlier but milkweeds are the types of plants that you want that are very important to support monarch butterflies in fact milkweed is the only plant that the larva will feed on so this is one of the reasons why monarchs are having such a hard time is because they're so specific on the type of plant. There are many different types of milkweed that you can plant, and there are some great resources on how you can find out more about those types of plants, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. But um, the milkweed is very important to the monarch butterfly because when the caterpillars eat the milkweed, they get that toxic substance into their body and it actually makes them toxic for other animals to eat them. So it's very important that at this stage, when they're larva, they're able to feed on milkweed plants. So this is a piece of a milkweed leaf here that you can see that the baby has just hatched out of. Again, this is another photo that I took um, during, their, during monarch raising here in previous summers. So um, they, they, like I said, it takes them three to four days to hatch from the egg. And then the monarch, the monarch caterpillar will grow. It'll as it continues to eat, they they continue to grow. Now, here's another picture here that shows um, that shows the baby caterpillar that I just showed you in the previous image with the egg. And I put a pen tip up next to it just so you could see how small that baby caterpillar is and how small that egg is. Like I said, it really does take. Um, it takes some practice to find these eggs on milkweed when you're looking for them, especially if you're trying to make sure that you're not cutting them down or if you're wanting to raise them. They're really, really tiny. It's it's pretty amazing how big monarch powder killers get, but how small they start with. So they're very small. Here is a close-up of a baby monarch caterpillar in the microscope that I was telling you about earlier. So this is a close-up of that, of the, the, about the same size of the baby monarch caterpillar you saw in the previous photo. It's really amazing the transformation they go through, and it doesn't take long before they start changing. So this is, this is a very small baby. This is as it changes, and actually at the top of the picture, you can see that there's the shedding. So as monarch caterpillars change in size, they molt and they go through do several different molts and actually um, caterpillars these ca caterpillars go through what we call instars um, and these are different stages of their of of the caterpillars so they go through five instars they when five stages as a caterpillar and they change a lot during those different stages their colors can look quite different they get a lot bigger but um, that's one way you can kind of age a monarch caterpillar is by their size. You can tell what instar they're in. So this is, a, again, a very young caterpillar that emerged from, from its molt, still underneath the microscope. And now this next picture I'm going to show you, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, when I was raising these monarchs, you, you know, you, you see them in all sorts of different stages, and you can see some monarch caterpillars here in different stages. So you can see some monarch monarch caterpillars here in, in star in stars one and two um, on the top leaves and then you get down to the bottom leaf. You have probably I would say in star two, maybe three there. And then you can see the big guy over on the side here, that really big monarch caterpillar. That's one that's in its last stage. Um, the fifth instar before it's going to get ready to turn into an adult butterfly. 
So monarch butterflies go through this metamorphosis, this change, and it's complete metamorphosis in that they look completely different from when they're young to when they're adults. And that's one of the things that, in my opinion, makes them so fascinating. So here is a fun video that I took underneath the microscope of the caterpillar eating. So let me play it here for you. So caterpillars, they eat a lot <laughs> for about two weeks. And they grow to approximately two inches in length in just those two weeks from that tiny little baby caterpillar that you saw to the last stage before it turns into an adult. They spend a lot of time eating. You can kind of see its mouth parts there. So this microscope showed this baby caterpillar on the other side of the leaf and I was taking it from the bottom so you could kind of see it eating away there. They eat a lot. So when you hear hungry hungry caterpillar, it's really a thing. <laughs> it really they really are hungry hungry caterpillars. And when you raise them, when you raise monarchs and other butterflies, you really start to get an appreciation for just how much they eat and also how much they poop. <laughs> they do go to the bathroom a lot because they're eating so, so much. So that's one of the things to keep in mind if you're somebody who is interested in trying to raise monarch um, monarchs from the caterpillar stage is that they eat a lot, so you have to have a lot of milkweed available to be able to feed them, which we have here. We have lots here at the Nature Center. We have our meadow that has a lot of milkweed. We also have our monarch way station, which I'll talk again a little bit in about about in a little bit, where we have a lot of native species of plants for to support monarchs, and so we have milkweed in our monarch way station garden. Here is another video. of a monarch caterpillar eating, if it's going to play here, hopefully. There we go. So while I'm letting you watch this video, I'm just kind of looking through some of the the questions here that I'm that are coming in. I see that somebody says, um, "Do butterflies eat more?" Oops, and let's see. Um, do they eat more than just? Uh, let's see. Oh, and the comment disappeared. <laughs> I'm trying to view the comments on another screen so I can answer them as they come in. But it's only showing me a few comments at a time, and the comment that I was just starting to read went away. <laughs> I'm trying to see if there's a way I can see that comment. Okay, well, again, if, I, if I'm not able to answer your question while I'm doing the presentation, I'll go back through and ask answer that question. Um, somebody asked, are monarch butterflies the only butterfly that eats milkweed um, for the larva? There, there are other species that will that will feed on that will um, live off of milkweed, but um, monarchs are the the main species that do this, and that's why it it makes them it does make them toxic. I would need to look back a little bit more into my notes to see if there are other species that depend on milkweed the same way monarchs do. Um, but um, it's it milkweed is very important to monarch butterflies. And somebody asked, how do they grow so fast? Well, they grow so fast because they eat so much. <laughs> um, like I said, it's kind of hard to appreciate just how much they eat until you start taking care of them. And when you start taking care of them, you really grow an appreciation for how much food they go through. Um, it really takes a lot to keep up with them and make sure that you're supporting them. Um, we, the most monarchs that I raise at one time, and this is at the very upper limit that I, that I typically avoid, is about 50 caterpillars at once. And that is 
you need a lot of milkweed for that. It's very hard to keep up with all of that. Um, I try to do 20 or 30 at once. It's a better, it's a more manageable size. And you also want to take the health of the caterpillars into consideration because if you have too many that you're raising at once and you don't have enough space, then they're walking over their poop and they're coming into contact with each other and they don't have enough resources and they can spread disease more that way. So it's very important to consider that when you're thinking about raising monarchs. I have another video here to show you um, just of, <laughs> of a, two caterpillars that are feeding off of the same leaf. And it's kind of entertaining because if you watch at the very beginning of this video, you'll see the one caterpillar jump at the other caterpillar as it's getting too close. So let me let's start that again here. There it is. <laughs> so um, these were two caterpillars, again, a video that I took here at the Nature Center. And you can see them working on the same leaf, and they were coming kind of close to each other. And the one caterpillar kind of, I wouldn't say attacked, but jumped at the other one. But you just watch this, and you, again, it's just amazing to see how much they eat. Like I said, they do this for about two weeks, and they eat a lot. Typically, in, out in the wild, monarchs will lay one egg, this is what they try to do, lay one egg per milkweed plant. And the idea is that that one plant will hopefully support a monarch through from the egg through up to the time that it becomes an adult. Um, and if you've ever seen milkweed plants, depending on the type of plant, like common milkweed gets pretty big. And um, so you it takes a lot to feed these caterpillars because they go through a lot. Okay. So this next video that I have here um, is showing is showing uh, some of the, it's the raising cage that I use to raise the monarch caterpillars. And on the top of the cage, you'll see the leaves that are have the, have some of the pupa hanging. In just a minute, I'll show you a video of what that looks like when they change into a pupa. We also call that a chrysalis. But this is a video that shows some of the caterpillars hanging towards the top. Now, typically, when the caterpillars are getting ready to to um, to pupate or change into the next stage. Here you go, you can see some of these pupa. That's a darker pupa that's getting closer to um, becoming ready to emerge. So when their caterpillars are called larvae, when they turn into these little green things hanging, they're called pupa, and we call that pupating when they change into that. In the back of this video, what I wanted you to see is that there's a caterpillar that's kind of hanging in a J there from the top. And that is a caterpillar that is getting ready to turn into a pupa. When they're getting ready to do that, they after they're done eating as much as they can, they go up to to a high point typically, and they 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 hang in a J, and then their body just holds kind of really still as it's changing inside. And the change that's taking place from inside the caterpillar to get ready to turn to a pupa is just absolutely amazing. And I try to catch this on video. Um, these different things on video because it's really fascinating. Um, I'm going to show you a video here from that's not my video. It's somebody else's video um, that I found of a of a monarch caterpillar turning into a pupa. So when they hang from the top, they make what we call a button. It's the, it, at the very top of it, they hang from either the leaf or the top of the cage with this kind of silky, sticky material that allows them to do this. And then it's a really amazing because you can see in this video, the pupa is, is shifting and using its body inside to squeeze this outer, this outer um, molt off of the body. So this is the last time that the caterpillar is going to shed its skin.
So the the larva splits this, the exoskeleton that you see here. It splits it, and it starts to wiggle its way out of its old skin, reviewing the new skin, which we call the cuticle. Um, the cuticle of the pupa. So, and the at the very top, the the spiny appendage at the, or I'm sorry, at the end of the abdomen, is called the cremaster. And it hooks into the silk pad as this larval skin is shed. So the the chrysalis, the pupa, once it turns into the chrysalis, this lasts for about two weeks. And it's really amazing to get to see this change because once it turns into that pupa, you can actually see the colors change. So here you can see it's wiggling its way out of, of the exoskeleton. And it usually takes a few minutes for them to do this. I, again, I really find it quite fascinating. So you'll see it start to wiggle here. And actually that, that abdomen, the stripes that you see towards the top, towards the cremaster, will kind of shrink up as it turns into the, the pupa. There you can see the cremaster hanging from the top of the cage there. And the, the pupa is trying to wiggle all of that exoskeleton off. And most of the time that exoskeleton will fall off from the pupa. Sometimes there have been times where I've seen the exoskeleton not fall off and it just stays at the top of the pupa but a lot of the time it will fall off. And then over the next couple few hours, the pupa turns, it, it pulls in its abdomen and it changes its shape into this final, with this, what it looks like when it's in that um, final part of pupating. It looks quite different. Um, here is a video that I took of a pupa in the process of doing this. And again, you can see it wiggling. This is hanging from a monarch leaf. Usually they'll go to the underside of a leaf to do this. But sometimes you find them hanging in strange places. Um, you know, out near our garden where we have uh, a native garden at the front of the nature center where we find a lot of monarch caterpillars. Sometimes they'll hang from the fence rails instead of the, the monarch leaf. When they're getting ready to pupate, that's when the caterpillars are likely to, to travel around a little bit to find the perfect spot for them to do this. How long, I see somebody's asking, how long does it take to turn into a butterfly? Um, it's about 28 days or about a month from the time that, um, that the egg is laid to the time that they become an adult. It, it's about that time frame. It can be a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, depending on the environment and the conditions, depending on the food sources available. But that's typically about how long the whole process takes. Now, I didn't mention this earlier, but um, females lay thousands of eggs in their lifetime, female monarchs. And that's because not all of them, in fact, a lot of them don't survive. There are predators out there that will eat um, eggs. There are insects that will parasitize eggs. The, there are different types of wasps that will, will go into the egg and lay their own eggs. Um, and, the, you know, there, a lot of animals don't eat 
the monarch caterpillars because of that toxic substance. But a lot of their predators are things like other insects. So here is a picture I took of a monarch pupa after it was done with the process of pupating, of changing. This is, again, we call this the chrysalis. And their chrysalises are beautiful. They have this gold color at the, at the very top of it, the kind of like a line, and then they'll have these gold specks uh, all along the outside of their of the chrysalis. Now, when they first change, they're 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 very vulnerable. But then, as they hang, after they change into a pupa, they harden. Now, they they are still vulnerable. It's still not good for them to drop or anything like that. But um, they it, when they're changing, they're very vulnerable because it hasn't hardened yet. So here's another picture, and I apologize if you hear the phone in the background. I moved my phone, but there are other phones in the building here, <laughs> um, which I'll check that after we get off the presentation. Um, so the, mat the mature butterfly becomes visible through the, the pupal cuticle during the last 24 hours of this stage. So during the last 24 hours, the pupil will start to change to a dark color. So when you start to seeing it change to a dark color, you know that it's getting close for, for it to emerge. And it's really amazing because you can see the wings here through that outer, um, the, the outer the cuticle. And you know that they're getting ready to emerge. And it, it does take a lot of patience to try to get video of this. And I, uh, because sometimes they don't come out as fast as you think, but I was so excited one year because I was waiting and waiting and waiting as it seemed like it was going to get ready to come out. And sure enough, I was able to get some video of the monarch coming out of its chrysalis. And it, again, it's really quite fascinating. So you'll see the monarch butterfly. You can actually see a split in that outer cuticle. The head is at the bottom, so keep an eye on that because the head is going to come out first with the antenna. The abdomen is toward the towards the top, towards the the uh, cream master hanging at the top. So it's pushing with its head to come out of that cuticle, and you can see it split open. So you'll see it push here, and in just a second, you'll see you'll see some of the legs pop out. So again, that's the head at the bottom that's coming out first. And then you'll, in just a moment here, you'll see the wings and the abdomen come out. So the wings, it's really, again, really quite amazing to see the change but the wings when they're when they first come out they're very wet and they're wrinkled and that's because the butterfly needs to inflate them so here you'll see the abdomen drop out so that's the abdomen now when you usually see an adult monarch butterfly the abdomen does not look like that um, the reason the abdomen looks like that is because it's full of fluids that that it uses to inflate the wings so the butterfly actually contracts the abdomen and squeezes those fluids into the wings to inflate the wings. And you know, within an hour or so, those wings will stretch out, they'll hang down, and it's actually important not to, if you're raising a butterfly, to not release them within those first few hours or so because it takes a while for those wings to dry after the abdomen has pushed all of those fluids into the wings. So here you'll see the butterflies rocking kind of back and forth. I think that's just helping getting the fluids moving into the wings. I don't know if you can kind of see the abdomen there changing in shape. It will eventually get long and thinner as it gets those fluids pumped into the wings. And like I said, usually within a few hours, those wings are full size and the butterfly will just hang for a while 
as they let those wings dry. Here's another picture. So these are some butterflies that are newly emerged. You can see this one butterfly is still kind of hanging on to the um, to the empty cuticle, to the pupa that it was that it used to be. And you can see the wings look like they're a fuller size. Okay. Now, um, here is a picture that shows a great way to tell the difference between a male and a female. You can tell the difference between a male and a female when they are um, when they are pupa, but it can be really hard. Um, the easiest way is to tell when they're adults. So the top picture is an adult male. You can see they have these black spots that are on their wings down towards the bottom and the females don't have those black spots. The males also have thinner veins typically. The spot is usually what I look for to, to sex the butterfly. That's the easier way to do it um, rather than just depending on the veins because the veins can vary from individual to individual. But it's those spots. If you see those spots on those wings of the butterfly, then you know that it's a male. And if they don't have those spots, then you know it's a female. Now, something I do here um, is I, like I said, we do raise these butterflies and to help give them a chance. Um, and then we release them. So here is a video of some, some butterflies that were all about the same age and they came out at about the same time and we were releasing them. Looks like they're wanting to hang around, huh? Yeah, I guess they want to stay. You can come on over if you want. So that's just a, a fun video to show you some of the the um, some of the uh, the butterflies that we released last summer. I we raised um, over a hundred butterflies. I want to say it was around. 150. <laughs> um, so it's it, we we raised quite a bit last summer. Um, now here is a picture of a butterfly that we released that has a tag on it. So let me talk a little bit about um, about monarchs. They they were able to track and learn more about their life cycle and more about this migration that they make by tagging the butterflies. Let me show you a picture here. So this picture shows the migration of monarch butterflies. I said earlier that they have a unique migration where they travel 3,000 miles round trip in one year. So the monarch butterflies from up here during the summertime in the fall, starting in usually the end of August to September, we'll travel, make that migration down to a spot in Mexico during the winter time. It's a it's it's amazing that all of these butterflies from across the United States, especially part this part of the United States, travel to this one area in Mexico. Um, and you can see pictures and videos of this online. I, um, it, I have not been able to go see them myself, but I do know people who have gone to see them. And it, it, these, these butterflies congregate in the, the millions in these areas. And this is where they stay during the winter time. Now, there are butterflies, monarchs that go to other parts of the United States. So out west, for example, there are monarchs that will travel to um, areas, uh, some, some small areas in California. For the winter time and then there are some butterflies on the east coast that will travel down to south florida for the winter time but the majority of the populations travel down to mexico and this is one reason it's these conservation efforts are so important that we don't destroy this habitat in their wintering overwintering um area because if we do these these monarchs from all over the united states lose that habitat so it's very important to know about those conservation efforts and to support those conservation efforts in Mexico to make sure that that habitat stays. 
Um, so these these monarchs have this um, have this habitat now. So these monarchs, the monarchs that we have in the fall, that are adults, they make this migration down to Mexico. When you when you have your breeding butterflies during the summertime, there are, they go through several generations. So uh, let's say we have let, let's start off with a monarch an adult monarch butterfly in the fall. Um, you have the adult that can maybe emerged August um, and gets August or beginning of September. They travel down to Mexico. They do stop along the way, and that's why there's it's so important to support habitats along the way for the butterflies to stop. Now, when monarch butterflies are adults, they don't just rely on milk milk milkweed. They there's all sorts of different types of nectar of plants that the monarch butterfly adults will feed on. So when they're adults, they feed on nectar. They don't eat the leaves anymore. They use their long proboscis, that long tube-like, straw-like mouth to feed on nectar from inside of flowers. Milkweed is still important for that, but there's a lot of other plants um, that help support them drinking or getting their nectar as well. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a minute. So they, they make stops along the way. Then they make it down to winter. So the adult that came out in September is the one, same one that goes down to Mexico during the winter. It hangs out in Mexico for the winter time, this same adult. And then in the spring, this same adult that went down in September from here starts to make its way back to its breeding grounds up here in Michigan, for example. So as they make their way back, they will stop along the way and they'll lay eggs. And um, eventually when that when that adult butterfly is done migrating in the spring, that butterfly will die. So that, that butterfly, that generation that left in the, the fall, lives a pretty long life. So they make their way back in the spring. They lay eggs in the spring at spots along their way. And then it, they lay that first generation. So the first generation that they lay eggs of in the in the spring those those butterflies when they turn into adults are not the adults that are going to go down to Mexico the following year they it actually takes several generations that summer before you get to the one that's going to go back down to Mexico the following fall so the following fall the adult that goes back down is actually the great 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 grandchildren of the adult that went down the previous year. So the the generation that comes out in the end of summer usually get three generations between. So the generation that comes out at the end of the summer that's going to go down, they are biologically different from the ones that hatch out and become adults earlier in the summer. The ones that become adults earlier in the summer their only purpose really is to breed, lay eggs, and get to that generation that's going to go down in the fall. And that fall, fall generation, scientists have shown that they are biologically different. They're still studying a lot about them, but there, there's something different about them that triggers them to go down to Mexico in the fall. And they're looking at studies to see if their wing sizes are different, um, to see what you know what makes them go down in the fall versus other um, other generations, but it really is quite fascinating. So let me go back to this picture here. Monarch butterflies, because because they make this migration, their wings are actually much stronger than other, other butterflies. You need to be very careful in general about hold, handling butterflies because the scales on their wings do come off easily. They rub off and that, that can damage their wings. Monarch butterflies, their scales can come off too, but their wings are a lot hardier. They have to make a really long journey. So one of the things that we do, that we can do to help monarch populations is we can tag the butterflies. So here you can see in this picture, I've put a sticker on its wing. And this sticker is designed to be put on the wing. You can't just take any sticker and put it on the wing. This is done through a program called Monarch Watch. And they have designed these stickers over years of research that have specific numbers on each sticker. And they send them out to people who want to help with uh, research efforts of monarch butterflies. And then in the fall, 
or not the fall, in August, September, um, we we tag, the, I, I will tag the butterflies that we have here. So that way, when they're recovered in other areas, people can submit online. If they find a butterfly with a tag on it, they can submit the number. So you can see if the, where these butterflies are being recovered, where are they spending their time in the wintertime, where are they where are they stopping at to make their migration down? And it can provide a lot of important research, a lot of important data for us to help conserve these butterflies. This is something I do as a public program here at the Nature Center. So hopefully <laughs> in September, we'll be doing this program like I do every year. Um, in September, I'll be doing the program where I tag the butterflies and the public, you guys get to help me do that and you get to help me release them. So here is a video of one that I am releasing. A lot of times when you first release them, depending on the time of day, especially if it's in the morning, they'll just kind of hang around on your hand <laughs> as they warm up or they'll go onto the plant and they'll just hang around the plant. It's a lot of fun. This is a male. You can see those black spots on those wings there. And actually this, this adult got, uh, went pretty fast into feeding. I don't know if you can see the proboscis is going to come down here in the video. Um, and start feeding on nectar right away from that flower. So, um, you know, this is something that you can even do at your house. You don't have to be a certain, you don't have to be a naturalist, you don't have to be a scientist to help participate in monarch tagging and research. So, this last slide I'm going to show you is uh, some resources to help, and there's lots of great resources out there. This is just a touch of the resources that are available. Monarch Watch is the organization that does the tagging. So if this is something you're interested in helping with, they have training information on there. You can look up videos, you can look up instructions, lots of great stuff on how to participate in that. Monarch Watch also has a lot of great information about um, doing Monarch Habitats and Monarch Way Stations. Monarch Way Stations is a program where you you plant certain things, you do certain things in your garden to support monarch monarch habitat, and you can actually get them certified by Monarch Watch. Our monarch garden here is certified as a monarch way station. And these way stations are important for raising, for supporting uh, monarchs that are uh, that are that you're raising or for monarchs that are in the early part of their life cycle, and they're also important for supporting monarchs as they travel down to their wintering sites and back up during the summertime. So monarch way stations, you can find information on that on Monarch Watch. Um, Journey North is another great website. Journey North is not just monarchs. Journey North is a organization that that does a lot of tracking of all sorts of different species of animals that migrate. It's another way you can get involved and help submit uh, data for that. Monarch Joint Venture has a lot of great information on monarchs, a lot of, especially monarch gardens um, and how to, how to raise monarchs and things that you can do to, um, to support monarchs with different types of plants. And Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation is another one that uh, supports monarch conservation and conservation of all sorts of types of insects. So let's see here. I'm going to switch back to um, to me. <laughs> all right. Um, again, if I missed any of your questions, oh, I think I see why is the female brighter. Um, the female isn't necessarily brighter. It could have just been the way it looked in that picture. Um, but uh, typically the, the females are are the same um, 
This is very same, similar coloration to the males, or it could just be an individual difference. Okay, so um, like I said, there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, Monarch Way Stations, again, um, you can get this off of their website, but they have a lot of great information. When we reopen, you can get some of these pamphlets here. We have these pamphlets here at the Nature Center, but they have a lot of great information on um, Monarch Watch has a lot of great information on how to help support monarch butterflies. Um, another one, there's a company called Wild Ones, and they have a great pamphlet that is put out by Monarch Joint Venture that lists tons of different types of plants and how you can support monarch butterflies. So it's another great brochure. It lists all sorts of species of plants, nectar plants, uh, as well as milkweeds to support butterflies. So if you go to Monarch uh, Joint Venture or if you go to Wild Ones online, you can find information about this. And Wild Ones, you can actually purchase um, native, uh, native plants to support monarch butterflies. Um, so there's, there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, I realize it's been, <laughs> I've been uh, going on a long time here with this presentation. There's so much that you can say and learn about monarch butterflies. So I'm not going to take any more time now to go into that because if I start a conversation on plants to plant, we're going to be here for another hour. But there's a lot of great resources online um, for you to learn about what types of plants, native plants to put in your garden, how to support monarch butterflies. Um, again, Monarch Watch is a great website. I highly recommend that you go there. Um, to get a lot of wonderful information. And uh, Wild Ones, again, is a great resource for planting natives. Um, so I, I hope you guys enjoyed today learning about monarch butterflies. And um, I pretty soon here we'll hopefully be seeing them. And once we reopen, please come by the Nature Center because like I said, I raise these butterflies here for the public to see and it really is quite fascinating. So you can come into the Nature Center when we reopen and see the butterflies as we're raising them. And then in September, you can join us to tag them and get them ready to go on their way to Mexico. And it is so much fun. It's one of my favorite things to do. And you all get to help me with that. So I hope you will do some things at home to support monarchs and other pollinators. And um, I hope to see you guys back here again. So thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed these videos and pictures to show you a little bit about the, the amazing life cycle of the monarch butterfly. Um, I'm going to go back through the post after I'm done here to make sure I didn't miss any questions and to answer your questions. Otherwise, I hope you're enjoying this beautiful day. I'm looking outside and I think I want to get outside pretty soon myself. Of course, practicing social distancing. Um, again, if you want to support the Nature Center, you can donate on our website or on Facebook. Um, and, uh, you know, just uh, get outside and and start enjoying some of this spring weather. So I hope to see you guys soon. Um, miss you guys. Miss doing uh, doing doing some programs with you. Um, and I hope everybody stays safe and stay safe and healthy. All right. Take care. Bye.